So this talk is called Kubernetes the Easy Way. It has been inspired by a tutorial that Kelsey Hightower put up on GitHub, which is called Kubernetes the Hard Way and shows just how hard it is to set up Kubernetes. Um, yeah, and I have seen that there is lots of companies out there contemplating the use of containers and orchestrators and uh, uh, I was thinking that these kind of tutorials might uh, scare them to, uh, to use it, but actually it's not the case today. Today you can use Kubernetes in an easy way and uh, I'll show you how exactly and uh, what we learned uh, in, through a case study with a company who really aren't experts in container technology, but they could make uh, full use of uh, Kubernetes. So, a um, bit about me, um, I'm Adam Schandor, uh, I work for Container Solutions, an Amsterdam-based uh, cloud computing consultancy. We help other companies set up their continuous delivery pipelines and uh, production test environments, make their uh, development process smooth through the use of containers and uh, all the shiny new stuff. I've been a developer for most of my career. I switched to, uh, to the upside of things uh, just uh, a year ago uh, because I felt that now it's getting interesting. It's, uh, I was never really drawn to the world of uh, Puppet Scripts and uh, AWS EC2 instances. But ever since Docker came into the picture and container orchestration came into the picture, I felt like, yeah, this is the time I really want to get into this. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's my background. And, yeah, because I, I'm a developer, I like uh, systems that allow really, make it easy for the developers. I think the, the role of ops should be to make it as easy for, for, the, for development as possible. And then of course there is limits to that, depending on the technologies. And I have the feeling that these days we are really making big progress in, uh, in yeah, making progress in that area. I also like to organize communities and conferences. Uh, we do a lot of community work in Amsterdam and also in London. Um, it's a really great way to connect with people, yeah, and finally I really like playing Doom. <laughs> Killing hell demons is just so much fun. So, um, on to container orchestration. First, a bit of measuring uh, the level of uh, knowledge here. Can I ask who has worked with Docker containers on like any level, started them, created them? Okay, pretty good. Um, and who worked with any container orchestrator like Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos? Yeah, all right, about half the people. All right, so there is still people who will hear something new. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so, all right. Um, yeah, let's just, uh, then I will start off with just saying a few sentences about Docker. So Docker, in very short, is a way to package a single process as a kind of mini virtual machine. So instead of running VMs, you're running Docker containers, which are much more lightweight, and they actually run on Linux. So it's a, it's a technology built on, the, on top of the Linux kernel. And though it, on first sight it looks like it's just the same stuff as virtual machines, but actually it's way more, uh, it, it allows completely new way of uh, doing things. And container orchestration is, uh, the, the point of container orchestration is you have a bunch of virtual machines and you have your containers and you want to get the containers onto the virtual machines and the container orchestrator helps you with that. But it's not just a static thing to, uh, to like installing applications, but actually a container orchestrator will uh, will dynamically and in real time manage your whole set of your applications, all the instances on all the, all the machines and make sure that your applications run in an optimal configuration. 
that's the gist of it. Of this whole talk will be about the details. So I will uh, jump straight to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is one of the major uh, players in the container orchestration world. It's an open source uh, platform. It was designed by Google based on their experiences with their internal uh, orchestration engine called Bor, on which their whole infrastructure is running. Um, that doesn't mean Kubernetes is instantly as good as something they have been developing for 15 years, so there is still a long way to go. But uh, the first release was in mid-2014, and since then it has come a really long way. And Google made the step to donate Kubernetes to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is an offshoot of the Linux Foundation. So it means that the project is now completely governed by an autonomous foundation instead of being just pushed and governed by one company. So that's a, that's a really good step. Combine that with more than a thousand contributors on GitHub and you get a really truly open source project, a really truly community project. How does Kubernetes work? In a very high level view, you have one or more master processes running probably on their own dedicated servers. Um, actually, yeah, so we have master servers which run several processes. I will tell you about those in a moment. And then you have your worker nodes. The worker nodes are the ones that will run all your processes. Each of them has a Kubernetes agent running on it, and the master node, of course, talks to the agents to start your containers, stop them, move them around, monitor them, etc. And the master server consists of an API server, which uh, one of the beautiful thing about Kubernetes and actually about the other orchestrators, they all have really great APIs with which uh, you can manage your applications. Uh, of course, there is a command line tool, there is a UI, plus you can actually build like whole platforms on top of it because yeah, you can do everything that Kubernetes does through its API. Um, the controller manager is an internal component. I don't go into the details of that one. The scheduler is the is the one that is deciding which node will your newly starting container run on. That's probably the heart of Kubernetes. And there is etcd, which is not necessarily part of the master node. You could just run an etcd cluster uh, separately. And etcd is a distributed key value database, which is the other part of Kubernetes. It's, uh, it's storing the state of the whole cluster. And because Kubernetes works by keeping track of everything on the cluster all the time, this is a very, very important uh, concept, that you have a distributed database there. Also, the, the master server can be uh, run on several uh, machines too, so it's completely fault tolerant, the whole system. Yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's enough uh, about the architecture. Yeah, so this talk will be a bit like high level. I'm, I don't have time to go into the details. I'll focus on features, but after in the Q&A or after the talk, you can uh, ask about more details. I'll try to answer. So, yeah, and I need to check my time. All right. So why container orchestration? Uh, why is it good? Why is it a new and, I'd say, a better paradigm than what we have been doing before? First of all, Docker is a really great packaging format. You could imagine packaging like a bunch of uh, a process and all these dependencies in different ways in Docker, but Docker is really great because uh, everything is in the package. Once you have a Docker image, you can just run it anywhere and it leverages your existing knowledge. So you're still kind of making a little Linux machine. So you can like put in the processes, you can use apt-get to, to install things, and yeah, whatever you know already about Linux, you will be able to leverage when you're building your Docker images. But once a Docker image is built, you have immutable infrastructure, you no longer go on modifying it. It's developer friendly. Um, you can of course run virtual machines on your laptop, but you quickly run out of RAM and CPU and it's tedious. Building a Docker container is a breeze and you can launch as many of them on your laptop 
as you want. So that, that little fact brings it much closer to developers. No longer will this be like an afterthought that, ah, okay, I've been developing, developing, and everything works, and ah, now I have to build some VM or something to test it. Maybe I just keep that today. With Docker containers, you can include this in your default workflow. For the operation side, uh, containers, that's why Google originally invented them, uh, is for better resource utilization. You cannot be so fine grained with virtual machines as you are with containers. With containers, you can pack the, your virtual machines, on, especially physical hardware, that's where this originally comes from, of course. Uh, you can pack them really tight, it's just processes in the end, so you can define some resource limits for them, but you can put as many as uh, as the virtual machine can take. And with the orchestrator, if you have a lot of different workloads, it can pack them next to each other on your servers to utilize them to as much as it can. And uh, there is an application description language, which is for, actually, there are three orchestrators. The, uh, the logos down there, it's Kubernetes, Mesos, and Docker Swarm. There is even more actually, these are the, the major players. Each of, this, this is all true for each of them. So they have a pretty consistent design. And so you, you, do, you have a declarative language with which, to this, with which to describe your application, which is a big step forward compared to like installing, putting files and installing libraries and stuff on a, on a virtual machine and like then trying to get all those VMs working together. You will see, I will show how, how that makes things just simpler. So, we, uh, this talk is about a case study actually, kind of, with, uh, with a company called Zuber in uh, the Netherlands. They had a, it's a very nice simple use case, so I'll, in this talk I will not show really advanced uh, complicated things. It's, that's why this use case is really good for, for a talk. They are kind of like a Dutch trip advisor, it's a travel advisory website. Lots of traffic, relatively simple architecture. Actually, we, they, they ended up with like three, three different types of services. Um, yeah, so the starting point was they will be replacing their old site, so it's a nice uh, greenfield project. They were building 12-factor Node.js apps, a 12-factor application. I, don't have the time to go into the details, but it's a kind of application that fits really nice into containers. For example, like logging to STD out instead of files, um, that kind of stuff, not storing state in memory. Yeah, so it's just three services, the front-end service, the back-end service, which is communicating with the database and an admin interface. Not very complicated. And they had a small team of uh, only six developers and just one operations guy. So the goals of the project were to set up a continuous, yeah, so just stop here. Um, this was, the, the, the beginning was where they were when they invited container solutions to help them out with, uh, so our, our job on this project was to set up a continuous delivery pipeline for them using modern infrastructure, uh, create an application runtime platform where so basically test environments, production environments. And they wanted a really high level of ownership from the development team. So we couldn't create a thousand line of bash scripts and then throw it over to the developers, say hey, here you go, or that one poor ops guy to, uh, to maintain that. It had to be something that will be very easy to maintain in the future and doable mainly for the developers. Yeah. So what we did is we, uh, uh, together with them, picked a managed service for basically everything they needed. Uh, we, the database was Elastic Cloud. With that, we got rid of the problem of actually like storing data, backing up data, etc. And then there is the rest of the list. These are uh, not very important for this talk. The most important one is the container orchestration engine. Uh, we picked Kubernetes. And uh, mainly because they, there is a mature solution in Google Container Engine, which is a hosted Kubernetes solution. It's not a turnkey solution, it's not something Google installs for you, it's something where Google 
gives you an SLA and they will actually be responsible for keeping your cluster up and running. So for this company with the single ops guy, this was the perfect solution. So a few words about Google Container Engine. Um, it works by first installing, uh, creating in your Google Cloud account, creating some virtual machines uh, for your cluster. Uh, you will have access to the worker nodes. You will see the worker nodes and pay for them as uh, normal virtual machines in your Google account. And the master nodes or the master cluster is uh, completely hidden from you. You cannot access it. You can just talk to the API. Um, and they add stuff to Kubernetes in the form of uh, interacting with Google Container or Google Cloud. Yeah, so GCE is Google Compute Engine, which is their cloud, and GKE is Google Container Engine. It's a tad bit confusing, even uh, after uh, long months of working with it. So, yeah, so they, they do integrations, like for example, you create an ingress object in Kubernetes and they create a uh, HTTP load balancer in the Google Cloud, so it's nicely nicely integrated into their cloud, which is not surprising. Um, yeah, and they even build their own operating system, which is completely optimized for running containers. They're not the first to do this, but seems like they uh, wanted to go uh, with their own thing for that, and it works well. That's uh, our experience. Yeah, before I uh, dive into Kubernetes. Um, two terms I want to just define here. Kubernetes doesn't use the term containers, or it does, but the main unit of deployment in Kubernetes is a pod. A pod is a collection of one or more containers that get deployed together always on the same machine. So there is no orchestration happening. It's just uh, you can actually like pack several containers together. They did this because you shouldn't be running multiple processes in a container, but sometimes you really have to run multiple processes, especially for uh, for uh, applications that for legacy applications. So they created this concept of a pod. I never ever used a pod that had several containers. So when I say pod or container, it's just uh, for this talk at least. It's, it's pretty much the same. Um, and when I say service, Kubernetes has a concept of services. They are very specific uh, kind of object to which of which I will be talking about. But when I say service in this talk, mostly it will just be something like the front end, which has several pods spread over virtual machines. So it's just in the very generic sense I call service. There is, uh, yeah, just to make things simple, I will say a Kubernetes service when I mean that. So, first of all, uh, the continuous delivery pipeline, nothing surprising there. What's interesting is that, first of all, the local slash unit test environment is also Kubernetes. So, you can run Kubernetes on your laptop. I will be doing that if I have the time for a short demo at the end. Uh, so, developers can run, especially this is for these guys with three services, this wasn't so important. But if you have like a microservice application with, I know, 15, 20 services and you really want to uh, run the whole thing, then with Kubernetes, this is very easy. You can do it even on your laptop. So you can run like integration tests against a large part of the, or the whole system on your laptop. So that's the first thing on the left side. Uh, that's actually a small Kubernetes cluster on the developer's laptop. Another nice uh, thing we could do with Kubernetes was feature environments. So whenever somebody committed something to a branch that's, uh, that starts with feature slash, we, through, the, through CodeShip, we ran a build and straight away created a new environment. Because it was just so easy and cheap to create environments that there was no reason like, not to do this. And they really liked it. That was actually a better utilized feature than the, than the local environments. Yeah, and then there is a test environment and the production environment. All, as you can see, on the Google, uh, on, the, on the container cluster. 
Another nice feature that, uh, that we got from Kubernetes is service discovery. So, uh, on the bottom side you can see three pods running, three pods on the front end, all with their own virtual, inter in virtual IP addresses inside the, inside the cluster. And you can define a service, or first of all, you can define labels, just any kind of labels that you want on pods. A popular one is defining a label called app and calling it frontend. So with this label, all those pods are grouped together and then you can create a service which will, uh, which will do service discovery, which will expose all these pods that have that particular label will expose them under a single IP address and even register them inside an internal DNS. So you can just create an object called a service and you will be able to access uh, service, uh, all these pods inside the cluster on the HTTP slash slash frontend uh, address. That will not be accessible from the outside but pods can address each other. Uh, using that using that DNS name because there is an internal virtual network inside the cluster and there is a DNS server inside the cluster and it's automatically managed by Kubernetes so whenever a pod comes online or it dies it will get registered and deregistered for, for service discovery so the whole service discovery mechanism is baked into the system and you don't really have to think about service discovery anymore a second thing is load balancing. So of course that service needs to decide where to send packets somehow. So there is a random load balancing algorithm in there. So practically you also get load balancing just out of the box without uh, really thinking about it. You are not creating a load balancer, you are not creating a service discovery something. You're just creating a high level thing that is a service and Kubernetes takes care to provide you these services through the service. Yeah, that word is really overloaded, right? Um, another thing, resource optimization through auto scaling. Am I doing with time? Okay. Um, so Kubernetes can auto scale your pods. So based on defined resource limits and resource requests, which are like minimal resource uh, requests, so like telling Kubernetes, you can tell Kubernetes that this pod needs a minimum of 500 megabytes of RAM and one CPU or half a CPU. And based on that and the resource limits, uh, it will auto scale your pods. You can also tell like you at 60% CPU utilization, please create new ones of this particular pod. So, uh, once you hit uh, the system with the load, you will get, so like let's say the blue ones are the front-end containers and the red ones are the, you see that? Oh wow. Okay, so the light blue ones are the front-end containers and the dark blue ones are back-end containers and let's say black-end containers need more memory than the front-end containers so they get auto-scaled. But you only have those two nodes, so after a while you will hit uh, capacity limits. That's when node auto-scaling comes in the picture and that's like a thing that currently is only supported with uh, I'm not sure if you run your own Kubernetes cluster in Google Cloud, if it works I think yes, but at least but with Google Container Engine it works right now that they will actually skin up new virtual machines and destroy empty virtual machines that are not needed anymore so yeah, it works nicely you can also have zero downtime deployments out of the box. Whenever you change something in your application, you reapply your configuration files, and let's say the version of the application changes or something else, the, then Kubernetes will not just kill your application and start a new version, it will, start, it will do a rolling upgrade. So first, uh, you can see there, first we have three of the, of, uh, the old version, then a new one of the new version starts up and old version container will be killed. Another new version container will get started. Again, one of the old version gets killed and so on until the whole application is replaced. 
So if at any time the containers of the new version fail to start up properly, uh, the whole process is stuck there and uh, it won't shut down your, the old version of the application. Rolling upgrades are not the perfect process. I would like blue-green deployments more, but still, you just get this without like doing anything, and that's that's pretty nice. And then there are actually things built on top of Kubernetes that can do blue-green deployments and so on. But this is the default uh, uh, mechanism in Kubernetes. Environment isolation. So. Uh, you, there is two ways if you want to separate your, uh, your, let's say you want to run several instances of the same application or just completely different applications, like applications of different teams, um, you can either set up a different cluster for each of them, which in Google Container Engine is fairly simple to fire up a new cluster, it's just uh, one command. But, uh, and that's what we did to separate the production cluster with everything else. Uh, we wanted to make sure that if something happens on the really busy test environment where new environments are created, destroyed, etc., if, if something goes wrong there, the production will still be working. Um, actually, it never has, so now we are thinking of merging um, the production environment with the test cluster. But Kubernetes also has a nice feature called namespaces. And with namespaces, you can separate environments on one cluster. So you can have one giant Kubernetes cluster and run all kinds of applications on it. And you can even do resource limiting for namespaces. So a certain namespace will only have a certain amount of resources. And yeah, that's, that's really great because these are again super lightweight. So you can create a new namespace with one quick command and start up the application in that namespace. It's very easy and fast. And uh, that's what enabled us to do the feature environments. Yeah, some honorable mentions of Kubernetes features, some of them we didn't even use, but I just, uh, for those who weren't familiar with Kubernetes, just want to mention them. Daemon sets are a way to run a single pod of one type on every node. So like, whenever a node joins the cluster or leaves the cluster, Kubernetes will make sure that there is one pod of that type running there. This is great for things like monitoring solutions that need an agent to be running on every machine of yours. So, and, and this is great, you just install this on Kubernetes with one command and then the rest is taken care of you forever until the cluster goes down or something. So, another thing is jobs, like cron jobs or Linux are very nice, but once you have a bunch of machines, you need some framework that will actually distribute jobs over all of them. And if you're already using Kubernetes, then it's super great. You can just define jobs in Kubernetes. You don't need to install anything new, anything special. Kubernetes will launch your jobs on whichever machine has capacity for your job. And that goes together with all your other applications, so you will have maximum utilization of your uh, servers. As I mentioned already, it can create an HTTP load balancer with a public IP address for you. By just you just create a Kubernetes object where you describe a minimum amount of information and you get an HTTP load balancer with a gazillion of configuration values that, that are needed. You don't need to worry about them, it just gets done for you. And Kubernetes supports configuration management. You can it can store your configurations and inject it into any new pods that are that get created that are referencing and need those configurations. So again, that's a big burden taken care of you taken care of for you. Yeah, so Zoomer project went well. I probably wouldn't be talking about it here if it wouldn't. Um, yeah, so in two months we, uh, we went from zero to production. Not code, they started coding earlier, but with all the infrastructure work, setting up all those other third party services because even though they're third party, it takes some work to uh, set them up, put them together. Um, and developers were pretty happy to work with this stuff. So it was no longer just uh, yeah, ops people and us consultants doing it, but developers could just go and modify the resource limits for some service because they knew that, oh, now it's using more memory and they just had a few small files to modify, so they could do it pretty easily. Yeah, the and the main challenges were in like fine-tuning the auto-scaling, right amount of resource limits, requests, making sure that it scales at the right time, fast enough, measuring how much it can take, how many VMs will we need, 
Of course, there is auto scaling, but it might be too slow if you start up with too few uh, containers or VMs at the beginning, and so on. And yeah, the readiness and lightness probes. Uh, I will not. Uh, I think there is not that much time. Yeah, to go into those. Yeah. So, a happy Zoomer team. And uh, yeah, a few takeaways. So, declarative application description is a really great thing, I find. Probably not suited for all possible use cases because declarative is always more limited than actually doing some uh, flexible scripting. But when you can use it, it's, it's much uh, simpler and faster and uh, less error prone. Um, containers are a really great way to package your applications. And container orchestration is a, providing a really good platform for running your applications. Running Kubernetes is hard. It's a distributed system with a distributed database. So um, <coughs> unless you have a proper ops team, you don't want to do that. But others can do it for you. And there will be more and more solutions uh, for that. In the future, more companies who will do this. Yeah, and container orchestration these days, it's getting mature enough that practically any company can feel pretty safe to jump on board. There will be some rough edges, of course, it's still pretty new technology, but uh, yeah, but we had a very smooth ride with it. And yeah, we are working with several other clients also in more complex use cases where we did run, in, run into problems, but never really serious. So yeah, this is, we can recommend this, that this, this just works. At least start experimenting with it because other than lambdas, I think this is the future. Yeah, and demo. I think I have like five minutes, so I guess I shouldn't be doing a demo, right? Okay. Um, yeah, I will show you just quickly how does a descriptor file look like, at least. So you have some idea of that. So I made a little application with the front end and the back end here. And this is how the descriptor for the, for the front end looks like. So it's a YAML file. You give it a name. You give it some label for the, yeah, this is for the service to find it. So, and then comes the container specification. So a deployment is describing how you deploy one type of pod. Yes. You can use both hands because the device will be recorded by that uh, phone. Sorry. Oh, sorry, yes. No, no, no. Like it's easier hands? for you to use both hands uh, and uh, the microphone is not Ah, okay. Speaker. Okay, okay. No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you define the image, the, con uh, the Docker image that will be run. And then you define the request, the limits, the liveness probe that is checking the health of, the, of whether the container is running, the readiness probe, uh, how, many how much time out do you give it to start up, and you give it some environment variables, which in this case is hard-coded, but it could be loaded from a configuration map that you can manage on the, on the cluster. So this is it. The important thing is that there is very little information in here. So it means that the development team can actually manage this without much help from, from operations. So it produces a much stream, more streamlined workflow where developers can actually create like self-service environments because they don't, there is stuff they don't touch, but there is much more that they can control and they can control it in a relatively safe way without breaking scripts and having to understand uh, thousands of lines of Puppet or stuff like that. Yeah, and there, then there is the, the service file. Yeah, it's this simple. It just says map port 80 to port 8080 and name it front end and create a load balancer for that service. That's, that's all you need to do to get service discovery and uh, load balancing. Yeah, I will not uh, go into more details. So let's go back here. This I skip this too. Yes, so uh, thank you. And are there any questions? <laughs>